Good afternoon, David. Hi, Vice Mayor. How you doing? Doing well. Yourself? All right. Thank you for coming. Looks like we have everyone that we're expecting at this point, so I'll just get the meeting started if you guys don't mind. I uh, will call it to order at 503. Uh, this meeting will be conducted pursuant to the provisions of the governor's executive order in 2920, which suspended certain requirements of the Brown Act. Attendees may join the meeting through the use of Zoom with the given address. Uh, attendees will be muted until they are called upon for public comment. To make public comment, use the raise hand icon on your smart device or desktop computer or dial star nine if you are using just your telephone. Please listen carefully for the chair or city clerk to address you by name or number and for the audible Zoom notification that you have been unmuted. Once you begin your public comment, your three minutes will begin. With that, do we have any public comment? Seeing no one in the public. Who do we have oh, in the house? No. Looking no at hand. no hands raised. Debbie, Kirsten, and Patty. Awesome. Okay. All right, then we'll move on to communications. Does anyone have anything? Any written communications? Seeing no written communications were received, Chair. Thank you, Irene, and seeing heads shaking, we're perfect. All right, we'll move on to number four, approval of the me meeting minutes. I'll move to approve. Thank you, Preston. And I'll second that. Thank you, Joe. All in favor, can, can you give us a roll call, Irene? I guess it's just a couple of us here. Make it quick and easy or a thumbs up. Hi. Hi. All right, I think we're all good. Okay, current items for discussion. First one is update on the adoption of updated development impact fees by the school districts. Ashley or Preston? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure how often, but every so often the state raises the amount that a school district can collect in developer fees. And um, we had a resolution to increase up to that state maximum, which um, isn't, a isn't much more than it was before, but I think now it's to $4.08 a square foot for residential development and 66 cents a square foot for commercial development. So it's... Um, not very much money, but it's something. And so we just r raised raised the the developer fee to keep up with what how the state raises it periodically. Thank you, Preston. Do you remember what it was before that? Before the four oh eight? I think it was it was three fifty seven or three seventy five. Gotcha. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for Preston? Vice Mayor, I, I was I was just going to add that um, the the city was provided notice uh, by the Cloverdale Unified School District staff of the public hearing um, that was held on on uh, I believe it was June sixteenth uh, of the school board, and and then subsequent to uh, the public hearing, we were provided notice that the uh, school district did adopt the increased school facility fees and we were provided uh, a copy of the resolution. Um, we do coordinate with uh, building permit applicants who are applying for new development uh, where they have a form that is required uh, to be uh, provided to the school district administration staff uh, where they have to confirm that they paid applicable school fees. We'll, we'll continue that process and procedure uh, and it's just a good reminder that um, we do have that process in place that we require uh, any new development to uh, coordinate with the school on payment of their applicable you know, school impact fees. We, we don't calculate, they don't pay it to us. They, they, have, to, they have to pay it directly to the school district, but we do, we do coordinate in, the, in that process. 
Yeah, and I said the city doesn't release a permit to start work until whoever the builder is returns with a receipt showing that they've paid those fees. Right. And I could just throw in there that, um, you know, this is something we've talked about a lot and just the brief perspective, you know, on a 1200 square foot house, that's uh, $4,896 is what the school would collect. Um, and it just, it goes, it goes nowhere. If, if we, uh, just the basic math, it costs roughly $4 million, including the infrastructure to build a new classroom to house 25 students. So um, the, the real cost to house a student is $160,000. So basically we come up $155,000 short per head on a 1200 square foot home as on our path to try and have space for new students. But this is the state cap, so there's nothing any of us can do about changing that really. Thank you, Preston. That actually answered my question that I was going to come at you with next. So I wanted to know what it costs right now, and that was perfect. Yep. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that detailed report on that. Uh, it was very informative. Uh, my, my question would be, is there any state funding for buildings that we could go after collectively to try to get a re recognized impact? These are not going to buildings or classrooms. And so is there some mechanism we can work and collaborate on to try to get some funding in place to help other than bond funding, of course, bond funding and go to towards the, the district share of it uh, to get additional funding through the state? Yeah, so currently we've identified that really the most realistic option is bond funding, but we're currently maxed out, meaning there's a calculation that's done with formulas put out by the state that says for your community, and it's based on property tax values, you can bond a certain amount of money. And we're, we're not quite maxed out now because it, it has gone up a little bit since the last bond, but essentially it's maxed out. We're at like 90 some percent of our bondable amount. So we can't go for another bond right now. There are <clears throat> new facility funds, but the only way to qualify for them is the typical shell game that I know you as a city face all the time with state funds. Uh, those funds are only available if you have the students enrolled and know where to put them. So for example, if we bring in a portable, so if we get 25 more students, we bring in a portable to house them. That portable's lifespan is a max of 20 years. We just disqualified ourselves from the funding. As soon as we have, the state does a calculation and they look through your square footage that you have. And if you have space to house the student, then you don't qualify for the funds. But you know, it's a two to three year process to build a facility. So if say you got 25 new students, you have nowhere to put them, you make them sit in the rain for three years until you can get a facility. So it's like, it's just a completely ridiculous catch 22 there. Uh, the other thing is that that can be done is um, there are ways with the conditions of approval that are granted to developers where requirements can be made for them to provide some sort of infrastructure to meet this. There's, there's places that provide a developer, if, if they bring in 500 new homes, they have to build a school. 
and that just becomes part of their impact fees and conditions of approval. Uh, we can't do that as a school district. That has to be done in concert with the city. So that's kind of the extreme where some communities just say, if you've got a school, and, and our schools here in our community hold about 400 students each. So if, you, if you're gonna have 300 to 400 new students coming in, they say to that developer, you have to build three classrooms or build a new school as much bigger developments have been held accountable for entire schools. Obviously that's not gonna work with a developer in Cloverdale. With the Baumgartner development, they agreed to um, at least do the grading work and underground work for fields, which would be used, the, the idea is that they'd be used by the whole community. Um, and this kind of goes into the South Fields project, which is the next, next idea. I don't think that was ever codified in the conditions of approval, but the developer has a gentleman's agreement with the school district that if we have everything in place, when they're ready to start breaking ground on their project, they will at least do the rough grading in some underground. Developers have backed out of that before because it's not codified in any way. Um, you know, if that's in a condition of approval, then they can't back out of it. So we don't know where that'll end up, but we're doing on our part, we're moving the Southfield project through the approvals and the civil engineering so that hopefully all our ducks are in a row so that when they start breaking ground on that development, we'll have everything prepared so they can at least do the grading on our side of the property line. Thank you. And I, I, hopefully, I mean, this is a big thing, especially as our community grows. And I know we have, the city has um, growth goals. Um, this is something that we definitely need help to, to find solutions that are gonna work. Any other questions from anyone? Debbie, Kirsten, or Patty, if you have any questions to raise your hand. Seeing none, Preston, since you already started touching on the South Fields project, why don't you just roll right into that for us? Yeah, so we've, um, <clears throat> we've moved forward with the state paperwork we, we have no funds to build a school or something like that on that south property. But as we identified before we purchased that property, we went down there with the city and um, it would be a great space accessible to that new development in the school fields. So we've moved forward with civil engineering. We have in the preliminary design, we've got a full-size soccer field, a full-size softball field, and I think a full-size baseball field. Um, so there's three different fields there. We've got a proposed location for a little bit of parking for those facilities and a location where a bathroom sort of snack shack structure could be set. And we've also identified an area up on the west of the property that could be, I don't know the proper word, so if I'm quoted on this in a recording, it's given, granted, deeded, whatever to the city as a dog park. So there's a great spot there that would tie in to a future cross country trail for the cross country team that we'd like to have. And that would be up kind of on the west end, just directly adjacent to the Bumgardner property and could be part of a short trail system at the end of the road extension there. So th those are the, the uses we've identified. 
the dog park's not something that the school district would develop, but we could provide the land for. Uh, and then the fields, <clears throat> hopefully it's a cooperative project. Right now we've got that gentleman's agreement to at least do some grading and underground by the developer. And then, you know, we'll, we'll see what we, what solutions we come up with to further develop those fields. And the idea would be to have an agreement of some sort so that um, the community can go through like a facilities use process to um, be able to use facilities much like we have a facilities use process in place for our other fields. We have you know the shared agreement for the tennis courts and people can submit a facilities use agreement, they pay the fees, have the insurance coverage, and then they can use any of our facilities that aren't being used by the school at the time um, if they go and essentially rent it for some minor cost and have the insurance co coverage necessary. So I can say the superintendent's not here, but I can say that she's she's a big proponent of having public facilities available to the public when the school, who is also public, aren't using them. So we'd love to see the same sort of arrangement that we had, like with the tennis courts, something like that with our new track. I know there's a group of people that run in Cloverdale that would love to use that all weather track. And there needs to be some sort of gatekeeper to help us make sure that it's being used properly. But we'd like to have that sort of agreement there. And then that's the same philosophy that we have for these fields at the other end. Obviously we have soccer teams, softball teams, baseball teams that need to use them. But there's a lot of time where the other community groups that are doing sports could use those fields as well. So we hope it uh, becomes a shared community asset. Thank you, Preston. I know yeah. when I was on the board with you, we had talked to um, Jake about the underground and the grading and all that. And uh, he had made a comment to us about he was there for his investors and not for Cloverdale. Have you talked to him since then and kind of cleaned that up a little bit maybe or got a little bit more on, on board, I guess, to uh, instead of having it in writing, you feel better about their, their part of this? Right. So we're, what was kind of pushed as an excuse was that um, the district would never be in a position in a timely fashion to have the work done when they're ready to break ground. So we've been pushing really hard to get our end of the work done. Um, we're a couple months behind where I would have liked to have seen us in that process, but it is moving forward pretty well for a government approval process. Um, I see they haven't broken ground down there yet. So we're trying to get everything in place and then we will have that conversation with them and um, it definitely is something we should be reporting here to the city school subcommittee or having some involvement from the city too. Um, I think that's the time for us to say, yep, here we did our work. We did what you thought we weren't gonna get done in time. And uh, we're ready for you to put your commitment on paper. Here's, here's what we've done. So we've invested quite a bit in getting all that engineering and those approvals from the state in place. David, do you have any idea how uh, their project is going and when their start date would be? Oh. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, share an update in terms of current information. Um, the the Bumgarner project, of course, the, the tentative map was was approved by uh, by the city council. And subsequent to that, the, the developers applied directly uh, to the uh, LAFCO or the Local Agency Formation Commission. And they did uh, obtain approval to, uh, 
to annex the property, their parcel, which is uh, you know immediately north and adjacent to the, the school district's property uh, to the city. Uh, and that, that was you know one outstanding question I had was um, if the initial study, uh, which you know still out as as, as um, school school board member Preston Preston Addison indicated, you know it's out for. Uh, public review in accordance with the um, uh, state requirements. Uh, the public review period ends July 26. But kind of the one question that came up was um, was was the school district planning to annex the property into the city? I think that would be just an outstanding question about extending services um, from you know currently. Uh, Inside the city to outside the city, you know, unless the school property is annexed, we we did receive um, a comment from the uh, the Dry Creek Rancheria who owns the parcel immediately uh, to the south of the school district property that they've they've gotten or received uh, support to annex the school district property as part of their their proposed project. And we, we asked him just, and, and that's perfectly fine. We, we did ask him uh, to provide that in writing just because we want to make sure that, you know, the school district supports the annexation of their property into the city. And which, which in turn, I think would help address the, you know, any extension of services in terms of, uh, you know, water or wastewater to the school district property. Um, but, you know, getting back to, to, to Bumgardner, uh, so the annexation is approved. The tentative map is approved. They're still doing some uh, work on the on their final subdivision map. Usually, the final subdivision map comes with a set of uh, improvement plans for future development um, in terms of public infrastructure. Uh, and you know that that kind of an outstanding question that we'll be working on with council is you know how does this fit in with the um, the the um, current restrictions for connections to our water service, our water utility because of the drought. Um, so that'll be an issue we have to work through. And then ultimately doing the plan checking on the final map to ensure that it you know complies with um, the city requirements. Um, and then last but not least, the school district or excuse me, the council when they reviewed the tentative map uh, requested the developer to dedicate a uh, a, a parcel to the city for future development of a neighborhood park. Um, and they've submitted just a, a very rough uh, design for for the proposed park. Um, and we have since given them feedback to give us more of a, a landscape view of the proposed design rather than an engineering view of the proposed park. They, they have included as part of that um, a uh, part of their design, largely a neighborhood park with a tot lot. So quite a bit different than the sports fields that uh, is part of the, the, the project that the school district is proposing. Um, but where there is some overlap is with the, uh, with the proposed dog park. They have an, uh, an, a, a section of their proposed park that includes a, an area for a dog park. Um, so that there's you know, a little bit of overlap there, but otherwise, the amenities and facilities that the developer is uh, being requested to provide are different than what the school district has asked. Um, and the, what the school district had asked for in terms of sports field were something that very early on when we met with the developers, we had asked them to provide. We see a tremendous demand and need for uh, both both soccer fields and, uh, and baseball fields. And, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to, to partner with them if, if they're able to, uh, you know, grade that for the benefit of the school district to have those facilities. So I think that's a, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to collaborate. Um, uh, but, you know, there may be some discussion by council on the design of the neighborhood park and, you know, the component relative to the dog park. Um, at least my thinking is that the dog park fits probably better with the neighborhood park uh, and, and, and then in the school district could kind of focus more on the sports fields, which to me kind of ties in closer with the mission of the school in terms of 
you know, using it during uh, uh, it's, you know, the school day for uh, recreational programs, sports, for, sports programs, et cetera, uh, and can be uh, complementary to the education program. Uh, whereas traditionally you don't see dog parks being part of that. But that's, that's again, that I'm just, just talking out loud on that particular issue. Uh, so that, Vice Mayor, that's kind of an update on, on the Bumgarner project. If there's any other details, happy to uh, fill you in where I, where I can. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Anyone else? I just said it with, with the dog park, it really doesn't matter to the school district where it goes. We, uh, when we initially looked at that property, we were, we were with the city as well. When we looked at it, and that was a need that the community had, and the site happened to have a spot that would be great for that. Um, but I think it's really up to the planners to decide where it's most appropriate to put it. There's space up there if it's if it can fill a need for the community. Um, but other than that, the district really doesn't have any skin in that game at all. It could go wherever it works best. Um, and then as far as annexation, it was my understanding that um, to have contiguous parcels, the rancheria needed to be able to have the school district property annexed at the same time. I'm sure there's positive and negatives to that. I would, I think, and I, I'm not super educated on this, but I think the positives of being annexed to the city far outweigh the negatives. So, um, you know, the district didn't want to stand in the way of the rancheria being able to go through with their process. So we did support that. Um, I don't know the status of, you mentioned in a, a, another letter or document needed from the school district. The superintendent would have to address that. I, have, I do not know the status of that. But as far as my understanding is, in order to facilitate the annexation process for the Rancheria. Our South property there will be annexed as, as part of that. Uh, it was my understanding too that um, utilities would be, sewer water power would be brought in to the property by Bumgardner. And I would assume that, you know, potentially they need to cross the property somewhere for the rancheria. I don't know if that's the best route or if they're going up the main frontage road. And, you know, that would be beneficial to the district to have those, that infrastructure brought onto the property. And um, again, it's, I think in order to support all of that, we wouldn't have any major objection to that but I would hope that uh, at least those developers would provide those connections for the school district there. Thank you, Preston. I, I think that this is gonna give us, as this progresses, more opportunity for the city to work with the schools to uh, confirm a lot of this and, and kind of stand by you or stand with you with these developers to say, look, yeah, you guys said these things and we want to make sure that you guys stay true to your word. And, and uh, I know we're all trying to work together for the ultimate goal, so it's great. Um, since we talked about the dog park just a little bit, I would, I would say we explore it both directions and bring it up as a future agenda item. Um, because if I remember correctly, David, that park was only about an acre in size. And an acre size park is not very big. It's 150 by 300. So uh, it's like a third of a baseball field. So I, I would want to try to make as much for the kids as we could with that, because I, I think there'll be a lot of kids being brought into that neighborhood area. Just, and this is only me speaking. So like you said, it's, it's just talking out loud here. And so maybe we explore both ways on that at a future meeting so that everybody can bring ideas to the table and figure out what, what might work best when it comes time. But I'm glad they're actually offering, at least offering a, a dog park. That's, that's one of my ultimate goals over this four years is to uh, 
quit the talk of the dog park <laughs> in Cloverdale. Uh, go ahead, Joe. I see you unmuted. I just got lost. You're sharing your screen if you push it at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Somehow I got disconnected here. Uh, can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, I lost everybody, but uh, I, I just want to say I agree, and it would be really helpful. Oh, there I come. Thank you, Irene. <laughs> I don't know what it hit, but I must hit a button. Uh, actually, uh, I'm still learning on Zoom. <laughs> uh, it would be really helpful, I think, if we could have a maybe just a, a little work session on this whole thing, because I'd like to get brought up to speed, and I'd like to kind of figure out what what are the steps of the bug guard property and where, where they're at in the process, the annexation timelines, where the parks were proposing, the types of fields, just to kind of make sure we're all kind of looking at this through one lens and have a kind of a, an outline of steps to be taken as we move forward. Because there's a lot of moving pieces and, and I'm not as clear as I'd like to be on where it's at. I know there's a lot of, you know, speaking kind of off the cuff, and it'd be nice to kind of tighten that down a little bit so we're kind of looking at the same page and can hopefully uh, through the school board and the city council collaborate more to kind of have a more direct focus on this because it's a big deal and it's a big, a big community asset. And I know the district needs it and certainly the city needs it and we want to collaborate on this. But I'd really like to maybe get some schematics and sit down and just kind of walk through it and bring in the right players and just get a better understanding. And uh, so that, that would be my only thoughts on it. Thank you. And I'll try not to hit a wrong button here. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I appreciate first, that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. The first renderings were done by the developer of the Bumgarner property of the potential fields and such. And now the civil engineer has you know, put, put the actuals of what, what can you actually do here and where does it actually fit that will meet the requirements and get it approved. So it would be good for you all to have that updated civil layout seeing right where, where our engineers have gotten it to. And just one last comment. I always get a little leery on gentlemen agreements when it comes to major dollars. So I really think that's important that we have an agreement, but we really want to kind of make sure it's put down on paper and it's part of the process as we move forward. So, yeah. I, I agree, especially after being in that meeting, Joe, I completely agree because uh, it's quite the car salesman. So it makes me very, very nervous. Um, maybe, I don't, I don't know what you guys are thinking of this, and I don't see anywhere on here. The next meeting, maybe it can be in person and we can meet at like the makerspace and all bring map, have our maps and everything there together. Um, if everybody's in agreement, we'll kind of bring that up at the end, but just keep that in mind. I think that'd be great to have tangible items and everybody standing there looking at them. Yeah, yeah. I would definitely support that. So I don't see any hands up. I have, I have no one else. question. Um, it might be, yeah, it might be silly. I've been out of the construction game for a little while, so uh, Trustee Addison and Vice Mayor Lance might already know this. Um, just talking about the possible construction and um, them doing the grading for our property makes me think about an encroachment permit, and I'm just curious if when that time comes, now would the school have to obtain a, the, an encroachment permit? Or would that fall under the Bumgarner Ranch and they would extend an encroachment permit? Or I, I just want some clarification on that. I just want to make sure that whenever Bumgarner's ready, we're ready too if it falls on us. So we're not waiting and it doesn't get approved or takes a long time and then they're done with their part and we don't have an encroachment permit or, or how that works. I could be totally misled on how that works, but. So Ashley, when we talked about, if you guys don't mind it, when we talked about it a while back, if the school is the one initiating, then everything is going to have to be done at prevailing wage and, and so on and so forth. If the developer is 
doing things and he's rough grading and just continues his work in certain areas and the school district is not suing them for destroying their property that's okay that and so it gets written into paperwork it's it's it becomes almost a, a gray area as i understood it i'm sure that it would get cleaned up when it was necessarily time but it would not be on the school to do that because then it would change the the way it looks and how much people have to pay and things like that okay you your money yeah the developer preferred to do an in-kind contribution so they would be doing the work um we're going through getting the approvals from the state so that's okay. That's on the district because it's on our property. Uh, but we wouldn't be doing the work. And for the district property currently, we wouldn't be encroaching on the city property to do work. That's where the encroachment comes in. Okay. When you have to go over on the city property. Once the roads are put in right beside the property line by the development and those roads I'm assuming become city property then if the school district did further development and had to go into those roads for utilities and any connections then when we're connecting to touching working on city-owned property that would trigger an encroachment permit so I'm sure the developer has to get an encroachment permit on the north end of their property where they're right to what city owned. Okay. How'd I do, David? <laughs> I, you, you, hit it, you hit it right on, uh, Preston. I, you, you, you covered all the bases. <laughs> uh, good job. Thank you, guys. Any other questions, comments, concerns? I don't see any hands up yet, so. But, Vice Mayor, none, uh, yes, sir. I just, just to add, um, one of the things that the city has done is we retained uh, a engineering firm G GHD to do an infrastructure analysis in what we call we call that whole area uh, that includes Bumgarner, the school property, and then the Dry Creek Rancheria property called the Southwest Planning Area. Um, they're they're almost complete with their infrastructure assessment. Um, the, the intent was to update our, both our sewer, water, and drainage master plans for those areas to, uh, you know, make sure we can accommodate the, uh, you know, future um, demands, you know, from our water system, uh, wastewater flows, storm drainage, et cetera. Uh, we anticipate packaging that up and being able to present that to, to council. Um, I, I see that likewise as an opportunity uh, to share that information with, uh, you know, it's all going to become public as part of our master plan, but to share with the school district, we, we tried to, you know, make our best guess assumptions as to uh, what would be required to support infrastructure development or support future development of the, the school district property uh, by, you know, and, and then adjacent development, the Dry Creek property. Um, uh, you know, that helped us size the proposed infrastructure uh, in that area to accommodate future development. So, you know, it's something that we'd really want to make sure that, uh, you know, we, the, the engineering work is uh, reflective of the proposed future developments. I don't see anything here with the, the South Fields development project that would be a real concern. Um, but we want to just make sure that you know, any uh, proposed development by the school district can be accommodated by the, you know, any of the, the um, uh, public infrastructure that we've, you know, at least designed to the master plan, update in the master planning process. So I just want to be upfront and transparent. And that's where we're, we're, you know, we're trying to, our best to kind of plan for future development of that whole, that whole area there by doing this work. Thank you. Uh, that's smart to be forward thinking. It didn't happen in the past in Cloverdale. <laughs> All right. And I think, we'll I think that document that was that's having has the public hearing for the South property. I know that part of that was calculating the loads of potential development on our property. So I know that those counts for the school district property have all been done. 
as far as what load they would impose on on the infrastructure. Yeah, I think we tried to assume kind of you know worst case um, just to make sure we we're, we're building in adequate you know capacity in our water and wastewater and storm drain systems. Um, and of course, we can scale back if, if it's not not kind of the you know what does he call it worst case, but it doesn't mean it mean it's bad. It just means we're trying to ensure that uh, the the size is adequate. Great. Moving forward, update on draft Times Square stormwater alternatives analysis. Is there anything new on this? Vice Mayor, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just add um, we you know at the um, the last meeting we reviewed the updated uh, analysis that was prepared by Brelge and Race, um, and I you know we did receive the the correspondence from uh, Superintendent McLean that uh, you know I think in terms of the cost of improvements, uh, I, I think you know the school district city you know it's uh, reflective of the uh, proposed uh, developer's responsibility. And and we're 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 looking at that closely, and and um, uh, obviously we're processing the uh, application for future development of the wellness center, uh, and, and as well as looking at it through the lens that this is city-owned property. Um, so we're we're going to be um, taking a close look at you know the infrastructure improvements that are necessary and the cost, and uh, I anticipate there'll be you know future discussions with with the school district, the developer, and the citrus fair on how we can work together to um, uh, you know, develop the Times Square property and, and, you know, and address the drainage issues. So that's, that's kind of where we're at, but we're still, we're still trying to do our homework and uh, evaluate you know, how are we going to address that project. And I think the biggest issue, um, you know, there's really two things. We, we want to be able to agree on the engineering solution. So that's kind of one. Um, and it, it, you know, thing that we'd like to be able to say, yeah, we agree with how we want to uh, address the drainage, you know, from a from a, a public infrastructure perspective. Um, and then once we once we agree on on the solution, then I think it's really about how do we how do we pay for it. And I think that's the conversation we need to have, um, you know, both internally as an organization as a city, uh, and, and you know, we we are the recipient of. Uh, uh, relief funds from the federal government. You know, there's opportunities for us uh, uh, to to seek ways to fund some of those improvements, uh, and then and then likewise, you know, through maybe uh, agreements with with the the developer, um, you know, some kind of reimbursement of uh, impact fees to help fund some of the the public infrastructure that's critical to their development, but also to the community. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it requires us to really work together, not just the school district of the city, but, but the citrus fair as well. So we're all kind of, you know, just trying to figure out how we can partner and collaborate on this, on this project. Um, and so we're, we're, uh, right now it's kind of on our, in our court to figure out, uh, what are some, some options and alternatives to bring forward, uh, for this committee, for our council. Thank you, sir. Preston. I, I think this is another opportunity to to sit down and look at that there. Um, from from my perspective, I'd like to see our side of the the curb, the road, the future extension of Washington and stuff as, as we're finalizing our gym project, get that wrapped up and cleaned up so. I'd like to see that side kind of finalized basically at the curb line. Um, so I'd like, you know, to, to look at that and see what we can put our heads together to, to see if we can start solving some of those things and getting it done and, and pushing it forward. Um, so, but for, for the school district, if there's anything on our side of the curb there that we want to get taken care of, I think now's the time because we're about to wrap up our construction projects and, um, you know, I'd like to make sure I've 
said it before there along, along the curb there, I'd like to make sure everything's coordinated so that we're not putting anything in along the curb that's going to be a detriment to the city's future development of that through street. Vice Mayor, you're on mute. You're muted. <laughs> Stupid thing, I turned it off one second. Uh, our next meeting is scheduled for September 20th. Is that too late of a date for the school or the city to maybe meet sooner at a special meeting to get this resolved? What do you guys think? I know I'm not 100% sure on the timeline from the city, from the school side, um, but I know that we do need to, it is a fast timeline right now. And, and David, I don't know how much time you need right now or where you guys are at. So I, I, I'm just kind of throwing it out there that if, if we could be more prepared or prepared to meet sooner than September 20th, I'd really like to do so, so that everybody can, you know, get, get it done right and, and it's as efficient as possible and get Debbie moving forward as well with her project. Yeah, I would support that. Yeah, I think that, that's, that's a good point, Vice Mayor. And I think, um, you know, we're, we're working closely with uh, the Wellness Center and, and Debbie Howe um, on the, you know, finalizing the purchase and sale agreement. And, and you know, I, I think, you know, that will be a, a key milestone um, that will happen, I, I think, and anticipate uh, in the relatively near future. Uh, but we also need to have a discussion with council about, uh, you know, American Relief Plan funding and, you know, there's opportunity there for council to, to uh, deliberate, you know, utilizing those funds for, for possible uh, helping out with some of the infrastructure costs um, at the develop, you know, the fulfill the vision of Times Square. So I think those are all that are going to be uh, coming forward in the, in the, you know, within the next, uh, you know, probably a month and a half. And so it may very well be beneficial to have a meeting uh, before the, before September 20th. And so I guess um, I, I, I don't have a date to suggest at this point, but maybe we can all kind of keep posted and and if necessary, be ready to come to, uh, to, to discuss further as a, as a subcommittee. So uh, through the chair, if I may, uh, just a couple of comments. I would like to, uh, the Benjamin race uh, breakdown, I, I, you and I talked, David, I'd really like to get a sheet that kind of lays out a phased approach and what, what exactly needs to be done and how that's going to work and what's, what's the real dollars, what's it going to cost. I think that's important as we have the conversation. The, the other part of it is uh, I'd like to know where we're at on the annexation for the health center. I, I, when I spoke with Debbie Howe, she was hopeful that it would close by the end of uh, June. And obviously that has not happened. And I'm not real clear what, why it's not moving forward. I know you and I talked briefly about that as well. So it would be helpful if we could maybe schedule a meeting with some numbers get in and have the right people in the room so we could really have a conversation about it. And I do wanna just, uh, the federal relief funding is on the administration uh, police finance subcommittee to talk about what we feel may be the best use for those funds. And these numbers would be very helpful when we have that conversation as well. So I'm hoping we could have those. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Irene, I see Debbie has her hand up, if you don't mind. Hi, Debbie. Hi, everyone. Um, so, so it didn't happen, Joe, because I switched attorneys and didn't, it didn't, um, he went on vacation and then he got sick. So we're still on track, um, just to keep you updated on that. The other thing is, um, I, I really encourage the city to look at the American Relief Fund. The reality is, is we need a street, um, that extension completed Washington Street. Is that it? Yeah. And, um, that, that is, you know, it's always really bothered me that we don't have public access to a public school because Citrus Fair is a private road and so is part of uh, Washington Street, which I don't understand. Um, that was way before any of our time, but I would really encourage the city to look at the, 
the American Rescue Funds for uh, the project, its infrastructure, which is what the money is targeted for, um, the school district and the health center is a community benefit program. Um, we, we elevate the economic status, the health status of this community between the school and the wellness center. So I just would really advocate for that. Um, it saved all of us a lot of money and we could put that into our facilities, which is much needed. Um, that's it. I agree. We should meet before September 20th. Um, I don't know what the process for the city is to access those dollars, but I know my process is pretty intense. And, um, you know, for me to get the funding that I was awarded, I had to submit um, an application and budget and everything else. So I would really encourage that to be sooner than later. Thank you, Debbie. I appreciate that. We'll make sure when David, it sounds like you're the first person that'll be ready for the meeting. If we have to have it earlier, like you, you, you'll be the one that'll set a timeline with everyone. So I, I appreciate that. I know you're working hard on it. Any further comments from anyone? Seeing none, we'll move forward to the next update on in-person instruction for upcoming school year. Preston. <laughs> yeah, this one might be the short straw. <laughs> um, the school board has every intent of full in person learning. The requirements, rules, regulations change about every 24 hours from the state, so it's very hard to keep up with. Our intent is to be back in person. Uh, right now, what that looks like based on my interpretation of the rules is that we will be wearing masks on campus in student settings. Um, currently, it looks like you don't have to wear them outside, but you do have to inside in a student setting. Um, and you know we're having spikes and surges, so I'm very worried about if that's going to change the rules, because it any any more restrictive changes really affect our students' ability to learn in school. Um, but that's I'm not sure we know more than that right now. But our every intent where our next school board meeting is going to be fully in person. And um, we'll have to have masks because we're in the school setting. But uh, it, it, there's no social distancing requirements currently in the school setting. So we don't have to try and stagger students and only have half there at a time. So my interpretation is that if everybody's wearing masks inside, they can all be in their seats in full classrooms like we were a couple years ago. And that's, that's what we're proceeding ahead with, the understanding. Of. Thank you. Anyone have any comments or questions? No hands in the audience. Thank you, Preston. Uh, we'll move on to the next one. Update on broadband access within the community. David, that'll probably be you. Yeah, uh, actually a pretty timely update um, last week at the council meeting, uh, we brought forward uh, 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 an update on uh, uh, two companion bills, uh, Assembly Bill uh, 156 and its companion SB 156, which uh, were uh, bills to support extension of broadband into rural or underserved communities. Uh, it, it appears that that legislation has uh, since last Wednesday uh, was was approved and signed by the governor. Uh, this legislation is intended to invest uh, three to five billion um, to help target what they call the middle mile and uh, uh, extension of broadband lines to support kind of the last mile by the the uh, the entity that's seeking you know broadband infrastructure. Uh, but it's it, 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 it it's it's good news in that it's you know it's providing the funding. Um, now it'll be incumbent upon 
the city and if you know if the school is interested to determine if, if this funding can be directed to to you know towards Sonoma County and, and towards Cloverdale to assist with um, upgrading and implementing this uh, broadband infrastructure. Um, haven't done a deep analysis of the bill yet, uh, and there hasn't been any funding guidelines that have been released. Um, but I anticipate that'll come out in the future, and we'll have a better sense of uh, how we might be able to access this funding to support uh, improvement of broadband infrastructure in, in Cloverdale. Uh, so it's kind of it's kind of nice, and it's one of the you know first times we've seen you know such a significant amount of tax funding allocated for this purpose. Uh, seems like it's there's a recognition now by our state leaders uh, that uh, it's critical um, to uh, in, you know for learning uh, for business uh, and just communication and, and meeting the needs of underserved communities and households uh, to get us connected to the the, the greater um, digital network. So uh, I don't have more to report on that other than you know I think it's uh, good news that the legislation did pass and, and that uh, we'll probably be able to look at opportunities for funding in the future. Thank you, sir. Questions or comments? I just say it's about time. I mean, this is like having a telephone. Everybody needs this. It's just basic infrastructure. I agree. And I'm glad that uh, Betha and uh, Madam Mayor, we're working on this one together and glad to see it's moving forward through the state versus just us talking about it at our meeting. So it's, it's great. Hopefully we can get some money out of it. Okay, next uh, update on the MOU for a school resource officer. I know that we're probably just kind of leaving this one hanging in the, in the wind here just because we don't have a school open and all this, but I'd still like to hear what everybody has, has to say and what they've been thinking lately because if we are going back in person, we're setting budgets and there's, you know, money's being thrown around, it might be something that we really want to look into considering all the uh, at home and the depression and the issues that we're going to be experiencing. It would be really nice to have an SRO in our district uh, considering they haven't had any law enforcement or public safety people in their lives for about 18 months. Um, I want to hear what everyone has to say, if you don't mind. Who wants to go first? Joe, welcome back. You're on mute, Joe. Yeah, there we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I had a, uh, I think the school resource officer program is outstanding. You know, we've had it in place. We've had two different people fill that role over the years and they've done an outstanding job uh, liaison with the students. And I know a lot of the students that had some really hard times at home would go to them, they built that trust and they would confide in them to get guidance and help. And not only that, to work with the administrators when there were problems and things on campus. So it's a, it's a real valuable resource that I'd love to see back in place sooner than later. I did have a conversation with Chief Ferguson and I think filling is gonna be a challenge and I know David, you could probably chime in on this just because of staffing. Uh, it's just going to be really difficult. Uh, we used it in the past, both by Mac Davis and Ed Bowen. The two former SROs were reserve police officers, both level ones who, who were retired and they were fully qualified to function in that capacity and they did a fantastic job. But I don't feel the city's going to have the resources to be able to, they don't have the resource in the reserve program. And certainly I'm not sure they're going to have the resources using the full time. So David, you might want to chime in, but uh, it, it's not looking favorable anytime in the near future. So thank you. Yeah, Council Member Paul, I, th I think you captured um, the prevailing feeling of the, the chief. I know we were having ongoing dialogue about, you know, staffing concerns at the police station. And, you know, I, I know more than anybody, he is absolutely a fan of uh, the school resource program having served one uh, in that capacity himself and, uh, you know, very much would like to see uh, a program established in Cloverdale. Uh, I think it's just critical that uh, uh, Superintendent McLean and the chief, you know, uh, continue dialogue on just, you know, what, 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 what the vision is in terms of 
what she'd like to see and, and, and to have that conversation with the chief to see, you know, whether he can, if there's ways he can, he can fulfill, uh, you know, some of the gaps that might be needed in that school resource officer position. I, I, I think it is going to be challenging to fill it at the, at that full time level. Um, but maybe there's things we can do, uh, that are creative that might be able to, uh, meet some of the needs, you know, looking more at a limited, you know, um, uh, hours per week, but uh, I think you know limited is better than none. And if we can accommodate that in some way and and still meet uh, the demands, you know, patrol demands of the city, I think there's definitely a willingness there. It's just uh, how are we going to accomplish it with our with our uh, uh, you know with our with our patrol staff as it is currently. So just just as a follow up, if I may, uh, would you be able to ask Chief? Ferguson to maybe set up a meeting with the superintendent to have that dialogue and we leave this on the agenda so we can be brought up updated as to how it's moving forward and is it even doable because I agree even in a limited capacity even if it's two days out of the week for three hours each day it's it's definitely it, it could fill a void and have that presence on campus and uh, start kind of building that that rapport within the, the, the school. So thank you. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, Councilmember Paula, uh, we'll ha I'll follow up with the chief and, you know, um, I, I, I imagine superintendent is pretty busy with summer, summer vacation, but see if we can't uh, begin a dialogue on how that role might be uh, fulfilled, uh, albeit maybe on a, on a more limited basis. Thank you. Russin? Yeah, I, the the school district still sees a need and is very supportive of having this resource. Um, we understand that staffing is a major issue, funding's an issue as well. But um, you know, the superintendent supports this, wants this in our schools too. So maybe if superintendent and the chief can get together maybe they'll have come up with some ideas but we're, we're very supportive of this hope we can find something some sort of solution even if it is part-time thank you ashley do you have anything to add um pretty much just echoing what preston said um just kind of thinking outside the box i don't know if there's anything County-wise, we might be able to look into also if there's any funding outside of just our city. I know, I mean, I have a lot of friends in law enforcement in Sonoma County and Mendocino County, and our, our jails are understaffed tremendously. And I know they do some, some things where, you know, they do, um, oh, what is it called? Like a career readiness kind of thing. I don't know if there's any opportunity there that they might even be interested in, might be worthwhile to just look into it um but I, yeah i think there's a great need especially after such a long time of our kids not being around everyone so and again any any form of contact is better than none i think and there are some grants available i know we were looking at one i think it's about a year and a half ago now And the superintendent was looking at the of that, yeah. if it's still available. Perfect. I was also thinking um, about the cannabis tax money. I know I've brought it up in the past and I've never, we've never really pushed to see if it's something that we could utilize here. But I know that when it was brought on, it was for prevention and education. And so with that, and I know that they were expecting to get, you know, a six figure number right in the hundred thousand the first year. But I think last year we had, I believe it was $480,000 to the city from cannabis tax. So it's a lot more than we were planning or budgeting, at least as I understand it, I would understand it as a new city council member. So maybe it's something that we look into that we start trying to find ways to um, fund a portion of this out of that money towards drug prevention and drug education to the children. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
I think it's more than a funding issue, at least at this time, it's a, it's, it's a staffing issue. I, I think the funding was approved in past budgets. Uh, and as far as the cannabis, I know there was a portion that we talked about when that tax was imposed was for the education component, but it was also mostly designed as a code enforcement to enforce both state law as well as the, the rules within the ordinance against the cannabis in the, to basically police it and, and that component's lacking currently and the city manager and I have talked about that and that's something that we're gonna be talking about at the police finance admin subcommittee is because we really do need to get that uh, code enforcement component in place. So, uh, but, uh, but again, I, I just wanna emphasize this really at this point, it's not the funding issue though, finding new funding would be really helpful, but it's really because of the strong requirements uh, to be a police officer, the, the amount of training to be certified by post is, is enormous. And uh, we just don't have the ability to just go out and hire somebody, unfortunately, to fill that. They have to be fully post certified. And that could take anywhere from 12 to 18 months to get somebody up to that level, unless they're pre-trained already. And uh, with the current shortage of staff within the police department, they just can't use the existing people at this point. But I think I like the city manager mentioned, I really feel coming in with some part-time, if we can identify a plan, I think I think that's very doable for the short term. The long term really needs to be a full-time position. And I think that should be the goal. So thank you. Really agree, Joe. And thank you for the update on or the knowledge on that. I didn't uh, understand it was for code enforcement as well. So it's good to know. Thank you. I see Debbie's hand up. Debbie, please. Hi, um, I just want to chime in because I've been working on um, our, our uh, health center strategic plan for the last two weeks and um, the alcohol and binge drinking and e-cigarettes and marijuana use in our teens has skyrocketed, skyrocketed. And um, we're, we're very concerned about it. I do want to also let you know that we have been talking to Betha about um, on-site counseling. She's got a, a, a contracted entity right now that she's working with, and hopefully that will continue. But it's something that as a health center, we feel obligated and, and, and encouraged to address. So it's, it's, I think we're going to really see some problems when school goes back into full session. Um, I'm very concerned about it, actually. And we won't even go into the adults because they're adults and they should know better, but even those numbers have skyrocketed as well. Thank you, Debbie. Any further comments or questions? All right, moving on. Update on the pool. Vice Mayor, I'm happy to take the lead on this. Um, actually, right before our call today, or right before this meeting, we. Uh, Council Member Paula and Mayor Cruz and I were on a call with the YMCA and uh, Sonoma County in regards to the Memorial Pool. Um, we there were just by way of background, there was a there was some um, uh, issues with the infrastructure that serves the pool. Some of the uh, pumps were leaking, which caused a little bit of an issue with the chlorination system. And unfortunately, over the last week, we had to. The pool had to be shuttered while they uh, addressed the issue, but we were able to get it back open um, uh, yesterday, and we're, we're working on a protocol to uh, to help address the communication out when when uh, pool issues arise. Uh, but a couple of things that are relevant to the subcommittee today: we uh, emphasize the the desire to continue with our collaboration on the the um, solar heating project. And the county uh, reiterated their commitment to begin the work as soon as we wrap up the pool season this year. Uh, so their their target is to start the work uh, immediately October fifteenth. Um, and and the and the words that they stated was that this is going to address uh, what they called it ninety five percent of the the uh, infrastructure issues that we've experienced at the pool. So hopefully there's going to be some additional work beyond just the 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 heating system is going to be a more or less a, uh, a near complete renovation 
of uh, some of the plumbing that's you know needed to support the, the heating of the pool. Um, so our hope really is that we um, uh, come come uh, pool season next year, uh, all the improvements are are in completed, and we're, we're uh, you know heating the pool with the solar panels or the solar heating system. Um, and you know prior to then, we'd really like to begin a conversation. Um, we, we reiterated the desire uh, to, I mean, one of the issues that the Y has had is uh, fulfilling the lifeguard position. Um, and we'd like to, you know, collaborate with the Y and the school to see, you know, to, to uh, see if there are opportunities uh, for uh, students to, you know, participate in the training that the Y offers uh, to, you know, become certified, to become lifeguards and help, you know, fill the fill that position uh, locally uh, with 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 the students in our community. Um, and ideally, I think we'd start that, you know, very early uh, in, in 2022, you know, if not, if not, you know, now or, or soon, uh, as early as January, uh, to get, uh, you know, see if we can't uh, collaborate to get uh, students interested in that lifeguard program. Um, you know, again, to get the certifications, get them ready to go. So when we, we come pool season uh, next year, uh, we're, we're ready to open. We've got staffing addressed and we've also got the, the pool heating uh, installed. And of course that uh, opens the door for uh, you know, opportunities where it's just, you know, the end goal of um, uh, allowing the school district then to have greater access to the pool uh, for uh, swim lessons and um, also, uh, possibly extending the pool season because we can keep the pool, you know, warmer uh, when it starts getting a, a little cooler, um, or maybe even open it a little earlier in the season, uh, which I think would be ideal for the school, maybe to uh, to have it, you know, open in in maybe in uh, April or May uh, for those for those lessons. So um, that's really the update. Is that you know I think the county is uh, fully prepared to. Uh, and committed, at least what they shared with us, um, to begin the work on um, the project um, in, in October. And so hopefully everything goes well and they're wrapped up and we're ready to uh, do a ribbon cutting in early spring next year and uh, open it up to uh, a pool that's a little bit warmer for swimming. Um, and, uh, you know, we can start looking at how we can keep it open later to uh, support our community's desire for uh, access to aquatic facilities. Great. Thank you for that, David, and thank you for staying on top of that. That's, that's perfect. Joe, go ahead. I know you probably want. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to uh, reiterate, and thank you, David, that was an excellent report. But the, uh, I asked the Y to send me some information on what it takes to be certified as a lifeguard. They're going to do that, and I'll get, I'll get with Betha, and I'm going to walk through all that. But the goal would be sooner than later to to try to spark an interest in our local kids to maybe go through the program, get certified. And because one of the things we had about a year or two back, I guess it was about two years back now that COVID, where we had the pool closed for days, uh, hit and miss days because they were unable to get lifeguards. And, and uh, we learned today, that's not just in Cloverdale, they're having a real problem throughout the county with all the pools getting certified lifeguards and by, you know, they can't take the chance on having the pool operate without adequate lifeguards. So it, it is a real problem. And I think if we promote it and get our own local Cloverdale youth certified and interest, plus they could earn summer money through that because, and we could extend it to weekends and uh, when school's in session, I'll have the pool open earlier, like the city manager mentioned, and they could earn some money as well as uh, fulfill an important void. So. Uh, we'll be working on that as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. Anyone else with anything? I'll just say I'm glad this is continuing to move forward. Um, been a long time waiting for a ribbon cutting. <laughs> I think the only person that's had to be more patient with the project is Debbie. But it's, yeah, I think it's going to be a great resource for our community. So I'm happy to see it continuing to evolve for the better. Uh, through the chair, if I may, and 
Preston, I understand what you're saying because we worked on this long and hard over the years. Uh, unbeknownst to any of us, the public health department came in and would not permit it. And it was a little shocker to everybody. Uh, I got to commend the county, Sonoma. They've really stepped up. It's a big ticket item and they're prepared to uh, do the repairs. And that should fix 95% of the problems that we've been experiencing all these years. So uh, I'm optimistic 2022, we'll have a heated pool with all new infrastructure in the pool and it should be good to go. Now we just need to get the staffing to make sure it doesn't get closed down for the wrong reasons. So thanks. Thank you, sir. All right, moving on. Update on school facility improvements. Preston or Ashley? Um, I guess I'll go. I, I'm on the Measure H committee, so I'm fairly up to speed. Like I said, the one thing I mentioned earlier that we're really pushing on is with civil engineering and the state approval process for the South property. So that's ongoing. The gym at Washington School is really coming along. They started hanging lights in there last week. So that that's coming along quick. We're um, probably going to redo, fix up some of the basketball courts that are out behind it. The um, elementary school wing is coming along well. That's going to be going. I think the target move in date is between semesters. So in December is when we expect that project to be complete. Uh, we're also making improvements to both of the multi-purpose rooms at uh, Washington School and Jefferson. Both those were in a lot of need of care. Um, I think they're running like six lunches at Jefferson because of some of the needs there. So lunch spans hours for those kids that need to eat on a regular schedule. So a lot of the changes and upgrades there are going to make it so that more kids can sit down at a time to eat and they can all eat in a timely fashion. The, there's some updates to the grounds there as well, the playground and such that's, that's going to come along with the school building. And then the, the track and field portion of the project at the high school is complete, as most people know. All the roofs, for the most part, are being redone as part of this. They were all in a lot of need. There's lots of rot. More insulation has been added. New TPO commercial grade roofs are going on all the structures. Bathroom upgrades as well at the high school. That was one of the biggest needs from the student survey. So when they come back to school, we're going to have new bathrooms at the high school for the kids and the painting is getting updated and done at all the sites as well. So everything's gonna have a new roof, a fresh coat of paint, new bathrooms, new multi-purpose rooms, and new facilities at every site. Thank you, sir. Anyone with comments? Uh, just a comment if I could to the chair. Uh... I really look forward to the district, maybe once the projects are done, maybe hosting at different times at each school, a community open house, walk us all through all the, the wonderful improvements that have been made with this bond money. I think it's really important that we make people aware of the things that have been accomplished. So just a thought, thank you. Now we're on the same page. The only reason we haven't done something with our our track and field that is complete is just because of the COVID regulations. They're drastically different now than they were even a month ago. So I think that'll probably be the first one that everybody will be invited to. And we'll happily invite you all to each of the other facilities as they come online. And uh, you know, everybody here has been very supportive of those projects and our students and our schools. So. We can't do this without our community and everybody's support. So we definitely appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? 
Seeing none, we'll move on. Update on proposed housing projects and future growth. David, I think we'll throw it at you since Kevin is not here. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I, the, the primary update that I'd like to share with the subcommittee is that there's a, a proposed development of affordable housing development on Osti Road. Uh, it's a, I think it's an 83 unit affordable, uh, you know, multifamily affordable housing development. The, the developers uh, who, who go by the, the name uh, Pacific West Communities, uh, a, a, a fairly large scale development entity is uh, hosting a, uh, a community presentation. It, it's not through the city per se. Uh, they're gonna do their own kind of virtual presentation of the project. Uh, it's uh, scheduled for July 21st this week uh, from uh, six to seven PM via Zoom. Um, Irene, if 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 you uh, if you if you don't mind, if you just do a quick share screen on the on the flyer. Thank you, Irene. So this is the flyer they uh, they released for this community presentation, and they're gonna. Uh, walk through the project with the community um, about their proposed project. Uh, staff still reviewing their application uh, and uh, you know addressing comments, working with the developer on comments. Uh, uh, to ultimately, uh, once and if the project is deemed complete, um, will be necessary to bring it forward to. Uh, planning commission for uh, further review, but uh, this is a this presentation is hosted entirely by the developer. It's not uh, through the city. It's a fairly significant size project um, on a on the TOD zone park, again on Austin Road. Um, that uh, again is proposed by Pacific West Communities. Other, other than that, Vice Mayor, there, there really hasn't been, uh, uh, staff doesn't have any real other updates regarding proposed development at this time. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm How going can to we get that link? Preston, I'll send you the flyer if you want. Or, uh, or Irene can send it to the group either way. That, that's what I'm gonna request. If you could send that to the group, please. Yes. Thank you. Um, you might. You might not know the answer to this, David, but any chance that meeting or presentation will be recorded? I think that we have a regularly scheduled school board meeting that at that time. I you know I don't know the answer to that question. Um, school board member White, I apologize. Um, I would I would imagine it would be recorded, but but I don't I don't know if they will. Uh, and so hopefully uh, you can make time. To, to view it or have someone record it. If not, I can, I can send them an email and ask them if they can record it because uh, there may be value in it. Uh, but again, it's, 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 it's not necessarily hosted by the city. So I'd be reticent to post it on, on uh, uh, you know, a city site, but uh, I can certainly ask if they're going to record it. Thank you. That's what I was going to ask, David. I appreciate it if you could just make that request So. A lot of people won't be able to see it, and I want to make sure if they want to see it, hopefully it'll be available for them. Perfect. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Um, information only memos or announcements? No, no announcements or informational memo right there. Thank you, sir. Future agenda items. Um, I have one that we haven't discussed yet, and it came from Mayor Cruz. Um, she requested, she said there's a, an artist in Cloverdale that is looking to do some murals. And she wants to know if the school would be willing to work with them with students or anything along those lines. And if there's any interest at all, she would like to c connect the artist with Betha or whoever the art teacher is or whatever you would have that would want to connect to maybe get the students doing murals at the schools in town, different different ideas, but it's very beginning rough ideas right now. And so if there was any interest, then it would progress from here. So maybe we can, if 
if we can just go to Beth and, or you guys and see if there's any interest. If there is, then you put it on as an agenda item for the next meeting or contact. Yeah, I would say that or... there's interest on the school part and um, definitely get them connected and well, I will make sure that they connect, they get connected and we can do an update on it as a future agenda item so we can see how this works out. And the other one was the dog park. I just would really like to put something on there to have the next meeting to show both ideas or different ideas that we might have in our town so we can really get this progressing and, and get a dog park probably in the next year. And then a special meeting before September 20th. And I'll just throw out there, I'm gone the last two weeks of August. I'm taking my children to college. Rough trip to Montana. And then on to St. Paul to drop oh. the second one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, any other future agenda items from anyone? No? Wow. Okay. Any pending items? Nothing? Go to the order? Anyone? I think today's meeting was actually very, very, uh, good we progressed in a lot of different areas and i think that in the next month we'll be able to start resolving things i, I love it it's where I, I i like to see things just keep moving forward and i appreciate everyone's um cooperation and you know flexibility with everything yeah i think so we have a very constructive group here including our audience members and look forward to knocking stuff off our task list so Preston, am I safe to say, Preston and Ashley both, uh, the next meeting for September 20th, would we want to have that at the makerspace? And if a special comes up or when a special comes up, it will be scheduled for the makerspace as well. And I'm just thinking, with, I'm just thinking that with a bigger uh, facility versus the city hall, little tiny eight by 10 office, it might be better for all of us to to do that in the makerspace. But if it's not, if it's not an option to us, please let us know or let me know right now. I'd say that's an option. And we actually, or I can coordinate or you can coordinate with the superintendent, but I'd also throw out that if, um, if we're gonna be talking about the Washington school area at all, if it's available, we might wanna go to the new gym or, um, see how far along they are with the multi-purpose room and the, and the makerspace. Any, any of those three, I think it'd be great, depending on the status. Well, then right now, why don't we schedule it for being in the makerspace in person? And then if the place changes, we would update it. Is that fair, David or Irene? Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's certainly fair, Vice Mayor. And I, I think uh, Irene, also been working on uh, identifying locations for our, our subcommittee meetings, just acknowledging that um, our conference room at City Hall here is, is, is a little small. Um, and I, I think at least it, preliminarily, we were looking at uh, future joint city school subcommittee meetings being hosted in person at the library. I did not know that, I appreciate that. Irene, I see you unmuted, please. Oh, no, I was just going to reiterate what David said. That's correct. I did not the know that. The library has that. graciously offered. Nice. I just didn't know we had a place yet, and so I, that's why I was kind of pressuring Preston. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you rather do, makerspace or just leave it for the library for now? And then if something gets updated, we move to that spot. David? I'm I'm sure. I, I, <clears throat> I like the idea of rotating it around if, if different parts of the school if it's available. I think it's a chance for us to kind of take a look around and, and get a little firsthand look as well as accomplish some business. That would be my preference. Uh, certainly the library is a good backup. So then why don't we say it will be at CHS because that will leave a gym as an option, down on the track and field as an option, makerspace as an option. We'll just say it's at CHS for the, the next meeting on September 20th. And if something changes with a special, then it will have to be in a different location where we want it to be. Perfect. 
So then the next meeting, September 20th, five o'clock. And with nothing else, we the meeting will be adjourned at 6.33. Thank you guys for everything. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, everybody. Thank you.